The Old Testament reading um, is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 6 and we're reading verses 13 to 21. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley and when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord together with the chest containing the gold objects and placed them on, a la on the large rock. On that day, the people of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and they returned that same day to Ekron. These are the gold tumours the Philistines sent as a guilt offering to the Lord. One each for Ashdod, Gaza, Ashkelon, Gath and Ekron. And the number of the gold rats was according to the number of Philistine towns belonging to the five rulers the fortified towns with their country villages. The large rock on which the Levites set the Ark of the Lord is a witness to this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the Ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? Then they sent messages to the people of Kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up to your town. The New Testament readings from Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem and Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him.
Let me pray for us as we look at God's word together. Our Father, thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for providing daily for us and for providing your word. We pray that you would feed us with it now so that we will grow in our love for Jesus. Amen. Well, on this day in history, the 15th of May 1928, Mickey Mouse made his first ever appearance in a silent film called Plain Crazy. I won't ask you if you remember it coming out. Uh, in 1940, uh, Richard and Morris MacDonald opened the first McDonald's restaurant in California. Uh, this is the third one, apparently, the one on the screen, still functioning. Uh, in 2010, Jessica Watson became the youngest person at 16 years of age to sail solo, non-stop, unassisted around the world. There are moments in history where things change, an event that's a catalyst, and everything's different. Uh, I'm not sure of those three which is the more significant. Um, Mickey Mouse, I guess, was the beginning of a new era for film and TV, McDonald's revolutionised fast food around the world. Now, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is a different question. Jessica Watson set a new benchmark for parents telling their kids to make something of their lives. There's a turning point in today's Bible passage. And all of those things that we've mentioned fade into insignificance against it. Jesus hears that John has been put into prison. And he withdraws to Galilee and his ministry begins. The world will never be the same. Certainly for his disciples, their world will never be the same. Because we'll read today of how he calls them from their work and he says to them, follow me. And they do. Why did they follow him? Why did they drop everything and follow this relatively unknown man? And why would we follow Jesus? Perhaps you decided a long time ago to follow Jesus. Or maybe you're still thinking through it. Why would we follow Jesus? What did those first disciples see in Jesus that made them give it all up and follow him? And will that be enough to persuade us to follow Jesus or to keep following him? The disciples don't know it yet, but Matthew tells us the first thing Jesus brings is light in the darkness. Jesus came into our dark world to bring light. And the catalyst, the tipping point, was a moment of darkness. Look with me at verse 12, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. There's a moment of darkness. John the Baptist, remember uh, John's mother Elizabeth and Jesus' mother Mary are relatives. John is put into prison. We read later in Matthew's Gospel that John will meet his end in prison. He's beheaded at the request of Herod's wife. But for now, Jesus hears that John has been imprisoned and he withdraws to Galilee and his ministry begins. Matthew sees here a fulfilment of prophecy. He gives his own translation of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and he highlights the geographical locations that are mentioned there. So listen, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 13. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death... A light has dawned. So it mentions Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum was a busy lakeside town. The print is a little bit small on the map, uh, but that's where it is, where it's circled. Uh, Zebulun and Naphtali were territories belonging to two of the Jewish tribes to the west of the Sea of Galilee. I've marked it here very roughly. And Matthew calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. He's picking up on the quote from Isaiah and it's a fair description. Uh, Gentiles just means uh, non-Jews. And during Isaiah's time, the area had been taken over by the Assyrians. And then waves of non-Jewish migrants had moved into the area. And so by Jesus' time, there was a real mix of people there. 
both Jewish and non-Jewish. Why does Jesus' ministry start here? There could be strategic reasons. Capernaum was a busy town. It would be a great place for lots of people to hear Jesus' message about the kingdom of heaven. But it seems that there's more going on here than just strategy. This is a statement about the nature of Jesus' ministry. Jesus came for those who need him, not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. Not for those who saw themselves as okay with God, but for those who knew they needed God's help. Verse 16, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. He said Jesus came for those living in darkness. The darkness of ignorance, the darkness of sin, those who knew they needed God's help, the darkness of death, the land of the shadow of death. In the Old Testament, in Psalm 23, the psalmist, David, knew God's strength and comfort at even the darkest times. Uh, you might remember the psalm. It's well known. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, or through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And the Old Testament hope becomes a New Testament reality because Jesus has come. And as his ministry starts, there's hope for those in the shadow of death. Ever since Genesis chapter 3, right back at the beginning of the Old Testament, the shadow of death has loomed. You remember last week we talked about the way Jesus resisted temptation. And as he resisted, he did what Adam and Eve couldn't do. They saw the fruit and against God's instructions, they took and ate. They rebelled against God. They doubted God's goodness. And from that moment, death entered the world. Sometimes I've heard death spoken of as just a part of life, just part of the natural world. It's, it's the way all things go. But that's cold comfort if you've lost a loved one. There is nothing more jarring than death, nothing less natural or normal. This world of death is broken. And so into this broken world comes Jesus and the promise of a solution to death. Jesus came to reverse the curse of Genesis chapter 3. Because he resisted temptation, because he obeyed where Adam failed, where Israel failed, he is qualified to stand in our place, to die in our place. And having conquered death, to rise again to new life. And he promises life everlasting to those who trust in him. We celebrated Easter just a few weeks ago and on Good Friday we remember Jesus' death in our place and the forgiveness that he has won for us. And on Easter Sunday we give thanks for the resurrection he guarantees with his own resurrection. You see, on those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And so Jesus' people can face death with confidence unlike any other. If Jesus doesn't return first, we will face death. But because we know that it's not the end, we can face death with confidence. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. You see, Christ's resurrection is just the first fruits. Christ's resurrection is the promise of more resurrections. Adam brought death through his sin, 
Christ brings life for all those who are in him. And so we can face death with confidence. Even though it might be a little bit scary because we don't know what it will be like to die, it's okay to not want to die, but even still, we can face death with confidence. And for those left, for those who grieve, we face the death of a loved one who's trusting in Jesus with comfort. Again, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You see, we don't grieve without hope. We grieve because for a little while we'll miss the one who's gone, but at our resurrection we'll see them again and we will see the Lord Jesus. And so we don't grieve without hope but with comfort. But all of this the disciples don't know yet. Jesus' ministry has begun and he comes as the light in the darkness. His followers will work that out as they go. Jesus begins his ministry by taking up the message that John the Baptist had been preaching. Uh, In verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And it's a message, it's a call that comes from love. One day Jesus is walking beside the Sea of Galilee and he sees Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They're fishermen and Jesus calls to them with a slightly cryptic instruction. Verse 19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. You'd expect a teacher to have followers But these followers won't simply listen and learn. They'll be busy fishing for people. They have an active part to play in Jesus' mission. And Simon, Peter and Andrew hear Jesus' call and they leave their nets and they follow him. Here is a man with authority. There's some evidence in John's Gospel that this wasn't the first time Simon, Peter and Andrew had met Jesus. But whether it was the first or the second or the third meeting, the disciples' response shows Jesus' authority. To call a grown man to leave his business and follow, and he does, Jesus had authority. Let's read on in verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Mark's Gospel tells us they were with their hired servants. See, these fishermen had their own small business. Uh, They were not necessarily dirt poor, as we might imagine. They had a good business going, and they left it to follow Jesus. They see something in him. And they're prepared to drop what they're doing for Jesus. And Jesus calls the disciples to fish for people. In the Old Testament, uh, in a couple of places, but Jeremiah 16 verse 16, for example, fishing for people there is an image of judgment. But this is different. When Jesus calls the disciples to fish for people, it's to save people from judgment. It's to call people into the kingdom of heaven, a mission not of judgment, but of love. The disciples are only at the beginning of their journey with Jesus, and yet they're ready to follow him. They don't know what we know, that Jesus has come to bring light in the darkness for those in the land of the shadow of death, that he will die and rise again and bring everlasting life to those who are his. The disciples don't know all of that. And they don't know what his message really means. They don't know that when he calls on them to become fishers of people, it's a message of love. That the kingdom Jesus proclaims is the only chance people have to be rescued from judgment. The disciples don't know all of that. But we do. Are we ready to follow Jesus? 
There's a challenge here for us. A challenge to turn away from the things that keep us busy and follow Jesus. To turn away from our preoccupations and follow Jesus wholeheartedly. Was it wrong for the disciples to be uh, working in their fishing businesses? No. Work is a good thing. It's a gift from God. It gave the disciples the opportunity to earn an income, to provide for their families. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. But when Jesus comes into the picture, priorities shift. And he calls them to reassess, to turn away from their preoccupations and follow him. The challenge for us is to reassess, to consider our preoccupations, the things that keep us busy, even good things. Because when Jesus comes into the picture, priorities shift. What does it look like for you to follow Jesus wholeheartedly? The first disciples literally had to drop what they were doing and follow him. Uh, Jesus, of course, is not physically present with us here and now. He'll be back, make no mistake. But for now, we don't follow him physically. We don't walk around after him. And yet following Jesus has implications for us. It changes the way we live. Last week, uh, as we saw Jesus resist temptation, uh, we remembered that he expects us to obey him and to trust him, to obey him when temptation comes, to resist temptation with the resources he gives us, with his word, with prayer in the spirit, and to trust him for forgiveness when we fail to obey Following Jesus means obeying him. And there's more to it than that. Following Jesus means fishing for people, being ready to share our love of Jesus. Now, for me, it's not hard to share that I follow Jesus because as soon as someone asks my job, they're going to know that I follow Jesus. It's a bit of a giveaway. And then after they've taken a backward step and recovered, um, maybe they'll change the topic, maybe they'll ask a question about church. But it's not hard to get to the point of sharing that I follow Jesus. For you, it may not be as straightforward to be public about following Jesus. But usually, if you ask someone what they did on the weekend, they'll then ask you. And if you're able to say, well, I went to church on Sunday morning, well, that's usually the giveaway that you follow Jesus. They might change the topic. Or they might ask you a question about church. But at least they'll know that you're a Jesus follower. And after that, well, we keep praying for opportunities, don't we? Opportunities to invite them to church. Opportunities to talk about the things of Jesus. We keep praying and we keep trusting. Trusting that God will bring those opportunities in his time. Trusting that we don't need to force the conversation. Well, so far we've seen two reasons for following Jesus. First, because he came to bring light in the darkness, resurrection, everlasting life to those who are his. And second, Jesus came with a message of love, rescue from God's right judgment. There's a third reason to follow Jesus. The gospel is good news for all. There's a pretty strong hint of it there in verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The content of this message is important. Jesus is proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. We've seen already, this is all about the kingdom of heaven. God's reign and rule has come to earth. As promised in the Old Testament, Uh, God's promise to bring about an everlasting kingdom. You remember in the book of Daniel, it spoke of it this way, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So this kingdom will be everlasting, not subject to the attack of surrounding kings, 
as was Israel, but an enduring kingdom. And this kingdom would be focused on an individual. And Daniel saw in his vision in chapter 7, this person was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. This message is indeed good news because it means that God will once and for all give his people the king they need, the protection they need, the safety and joy of experiencing God's reign and rule finally. But Matthew gives us more than the content of Jesus' message. There's also a demonstration that the message is good news uh, because Jesus goes on to heal every disease and sickness among the people, verse 23. Now, it's an age before modern medicine and maybe you can imagine the desperation for those with long-term illness or disability. And so it's not surprising to read in verse 24... News about him spread all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralysed, and he healed them. And so Jesus' fame grew. Verse 25, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea and the region across the Jordan followed him. The curse of Genesis 3 will be reversed. Here's a glimpse of hope. Humanity has been waiting ever since Adam and Eve's disobedience for the curse of sin to be reversed. Judgment, pain, death entered the world with Adam's sin. And the question remained, would pain and death ever leave the world? And now Jesus comes and he heals. He heals those with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, those possessed by demons, those who have seizures, the paralysed. He heals them. It's a taste of what's to come. For those who trust in this king, we may be healed this side of heaven, but we have the sure hope of heaven with all illness and affliction ended. Here's the Apostle John's vision of heaven in Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Don't you just long for that day? No more death, no more mourning, no crying, no pain. That's what the kingdom of heaven in its final form will look like. And as Jesus comes proclaiming the message of the kingdom and healing those who are suffering... He gives a glimpse of heaven, a taste, the first fruits. And as we read about this good message of the kingdom going out and the crowds coming in to hear Jesus, what's clear is that this gospel, this good news, it's going out beyond Israel. The gospel is good news for all. We've already seen that Galilee had a large Gentile, non-Jewish population But verse 25, you see, there's also crowds from the Decapolis, which was largely Gentile. Jesus is still preaching to Israel, but Gentiles are listening. And so there's a hint here that the gospel of the kingdom is good news for all. So how do we respond to this good news of the kingdom? Well, first, if you're not already a follower of Jesus... The right response is to follow repentance. The starting point for all of us is that we're not living God's way. And if you're investigating Jesus, then keep listening because you need to hear this. All of us are in the same boat. Without Jesus, 
We're in need of God's forgiveness. And the first step is to repent, to turn back from our own way of living and turn to God and ask his forgiveness. And if you're already trusting Jesus, if you're already following him, if you're trusting him for forgiveness, then we respond to this good news of the kingdom with joy and confidence. Joy and thankfulness for all that God has done for us in Jesus. And confidence or trust that Jesus has done everything that needs to be done. There's nothing more for me to do. I don't need to win his favour. I, I don't need to please him to stay in his good books. I've already been adopted into God's family and I'll want to obey him, motivated by gratefulness for his mercy. And so we don't need to win God's favour. Instead, we're, we're freed from performance anxiety and so we can live in joy and confidence. Why would we follow Jesus? Because he brings light in the darkness. He brings resurrection, life everlasting to those who trust in him. We follow Jesus because he brings a message of love, an offer to come into the kingdom of heaven, a loving offer of mercy. We follow Jesus because the gospel is good news for all. I'm going to pray and give thanks to God for his mercy in Jesus. Let's pray. Great God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant us such a measure of your grace that running in the way of your commandments, we may obtain your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.